Lindsay Brandt from the Center for Teaching and Learning. Lindsay, would you like to begin our conference, please? Yes, thank you. Welcome, everyone. I wanted to start things off today with uh, the Thanksgiving address of the words that come before all others. Um, this is a way to kind of ground us in a sense of gratitude and create a space of, of good energy and positive energy as we begin our morning together. So I'll start it with that. Ohondo garbudekwa. Gunjokwa seurohonsia skatni garibesa onugari nuwa ne dieti nuaron jina horo wasung gawi ne sungwa edison. Dieti nuaron ne ongwe sumon. Dieti nuaron ne tikni stoha geo hunjake. Dieti nuaron ne got negarunu. Dieti nuaron ne gunjok sumon. Dieti nuaron ne ohungwe sumon. Dieti nuaron ne onungwa sumon. Dieti nuaron ne oji nuwa sumon. Dieti nuaron ne gahik sumon. Dia tinerados ne junhequa. Dia tinerados ne gandirio. Dia tinerados ne garunda su andan ogore suma. Dia tinerados ne ojido ongoa. Dia tinerados ne gaere nigarage. Dia tinerados ne yetiso togo and radiveras. De chide when urados ne and chido achia joke neca garaqua. Dia tinerados ne yetiso da asoto neca garaqua. Dia tinerados ne yogisto garuno and jikiar and hage. De chide when urados ne sungoe dison, tokari no dohage ne guatni gora, tok ni gawanage. So, with that, we've we've gathered our minds together and, and offered greetings and thanks to all of creation, all aspects of creation that support, support our lives here. Um, and it just, as I said, is a good way to bring our minds together and create that positive space and energy as we begin our time together. So, with that, I'll pass it over to Clodiana Colomitro to get things started. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for that beautiful welcome and helping us start the day in a good way. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for participating in the Center for Teaching and Learning 2021 Teaching Development Week. I wish I was there with you in person sitting beside you, but hopefully you can sense my excitement and energy through the screen. Um, I am Claudiana Colomitro, and I'm the Associate Vice Principal Teaching and Learning. For those of you who are new to Queens, this is one of the CTL's most popular events. And interestingly enough, this is the 21st year that this conference has been provided. Um, so you're, you, you should be proud you're part of that legacy. Um, I'd like to start by commanding and expressing my gratitude for you choosing to be here. Um, not only this is an incredibly busy time of the year, but these are difficult times as well. We see increased uncertainty about what the fall will look like. I was observing some of your answers to the questions in terms of how you're feeling and, and we're all in a different space and place. And, and it, it's, um, it's important to take the time to acknowledge that. Um, but we also see broken notions of equity and justice and failed attempts at reconciliation. We have to set the bar high as we can do better. And you're absolutely key to reshaping our campus culture, and my door is always open to discuss teaching and learning, and I welcome your input and advice. A good friend of mine once said that anytime you leave a conference with a new idea, a new friend, um, or um, a new worldview, then you should call that a success. Um, so I really hope that you have an opportunity to reflect on your teaching, forge some new connections, and explore different ways of being, doing, and practicing. I would like to end with expressing my gratitude to the staff in the CTL for their hard work in organizing this day. Um, I had a look at the program and it truly looks amazing. And I wish you all a rewarding academic year. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Claudiana. Uh, now we will have Carolyn McCray, uh, one of our educational developers who will talk to you about uh, the center. Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you, Sandra, for the introduction. My name is Carolyn McRae and I work as an educational developer in the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, and my portfolio really focuses on how I can support um, graduate students, teaching assistants, teaching fellows and postdocs on campus in their role as educators. Um, so this is an exciting week for me. This is a great opportunity to, to get to know each other on campus and to get to know all the supports that are out there for your own teaching and learning development. Um, I am excited as well. We have a great program this week um, for Teaching Development Week 2021. And 
Um, our theme this week is from online to on campus, building flexibility into your teaching. And I think never more has that theme been so relevant as we look at what our transition back to campus will look like in whatever way in shape that, that comes this term. And I think that this is a great chance for us to reflect on um, what we've done in the last year, maybe part of ours, our remote teaching and what were the successes and things that built flexibility and equity and accessibility into our courses that we can now bring back into our on-campus teaching roles. Um, part of making our, our year a success, hopefully, is, is the Center for Teaching and Learning being there for you to support you throughout your, your journey as an educator. And what does that look like? Well, the CTL is here to support you, not just this week, but beyond this week and into the year. Um, throughout the next few days, I'm hopeful that everyone will get a chance to meet some of our fantastic educational developers, our graduate student educational development associates, um, our fantastic ed tech team that work on all kinds of technology, um, as well as the um, administrative staff at the CTL who make programs like this run <laughs> smoothly and possible throughout the year. Um, we certainly couldn't do it without all of our team together. Um, some of the educational developers that you'll, you'll meet hopefully facilitating sessions this week are Lindsay Brandt, who opened up this morning's session for us, um, who focuses on um, Indigenous ways of knowing and, and decolonization. Um, you'll meet hopefully Yuni Chen, who focuses on program and curriculum globalization. We have Yasmin Jarbal joining us, um, who does anti-racism pedagogy, as well as um, inclusive pedagogy. We have Lauren Anstey, um, who joins us on, on program and curriculum global program and curriculum development, um, as well as so many other great um, faces from the CTL that I hope you get a chance to work with. Throughout the year, all of our ed developers, as well as our grad student um, ed development associates, will offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, if you want just an informal chat about teaching and learning, that's something that we're all really keen on, um, and we would be happy to do. Um, many of us are hosting different programs throughout the year, um, and we have a great program uh, list coming up for the fall term. And I think Sandra is going to help me out at some point here, put some chat, um, there we go, put some links in the chat for our flyer for grad programs that we'll offer throughout the, the first term, as well as some programs for faculty, um, including some new workshop series um, in, in all of these new areas that we're working on at the center. Um, as well as specific programs for new faculty, which is exciting. Um, if you're a new TA joining us in the session today, I really encourage you to attend um, the panel discussion tomorrow morning called Demystifying TA Ships. Um, the panel is hosted by our educational development associates, the three graduate students, Clarissa, Samantha, and Monica, who work um, at the CTL and who are just a phenomenal resource for providing support to our grad student and postdoctoral fellow community. Um, for those of you who want to learn more or might need to learn more about some of our educational technologies, Carla and Selena in the CTL are your go-to resource and have um, a ton of great program options, as well as the on -cue support website and on -cue drop drop-ins, um, which if you're looking to do things in the learning management system, they are um, certainly able to help out um, with as much as you're looking for support there. Um, for grad students joining us as well, please take a look at that flyer that Sandra kindly has put in the chat and you'll see a new program this fall called TA 101, um, where we're hoping to reach out to TAs um, to learn more about your needs on campus and to figure out um, how we can best support you in your role. Um, and lastly, one of the things um, that you might need this year or you might be interested in is seeking some of the online resources offered through the center. So on our website, we have some toolkits that were developed last year that I think will be um, timely and well used this year as we plan for what the, the semester looks like. Um, so please feel free to check out our Transforming Teaching Toolkit as well as our Teaching Assistant Toolkit um, as there's lots of great resources in there um, that you might find helpful as you plan for the upcoming term. Um, and with what this, this flexibility um, that we're building into our teaching might look like this year. I think that that segues nicely into the introduction of our plenary speaker for this morning. As we talk about adapting and changing our return to campus, um, I would like to introduce our plenary speaker, uh, Graham Rennick uh, from the Dan School of Music and Drama, who's going to talk to us 
um, about there and back again and the work adapting Drama 100 introduction to theater during this past year. So welcome, Graham. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, okay, I'm just gonna get set up here with all the fancy visuals and special effects that Zoom can provide. Um, so this will just take a second. Uh, and I'm just gonna move my camera over to on top of the text that I'll be reading so that that'll be a little easier. Um, so, uh, yeah, here I am at the plenary uh, for CTL. I'm not sure how I got roped into this, but that's usually how things work in my relationship with the CTL. Um, I'm a CTL baby. Uh, I've been teaching on and off at Queen's since 2006. And, um, and I have been roped into many things at the CTL uh, over the years, always to great benefit. Um, and so I'm super thankful that it exists and I'm really thankful for the support that it is provided. Um, I am really glad to see so many graduate students here. Uh, I am an adjunct instructor in the Dance School of Drama and Music and I am a theater artist um, in some of my past, but recently returned to PhD studies. So while teaching full-time, I'm also trying to write this dissertation right now which is in the middle of the pandemic, which I'm sure all of you have enjoyed many of the um, delights of trying to write in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so it's nice to be here with people. Um, my plan is to speak for about 40 to 42 and a half minutes, maybe 43 if I'm pushing my luck, and then we will have time for conversation. And uh, I'm gonna pick up some of what I talked about um, at the showcase, the CTL showcase in May, uh, about what I feel like I learned with Drama 100, the course that I teach. Um, but then I'm gonna extend from that to some other thoughts that have been popping into my head recently. Um, it is really uncertain uh, right now, but maybe it's my optimist brain, but I do feel like the return to whatever the new normal is, 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 on, is on the horizon. Um, the, plane has, the plane has begun landing. It just may take us a while to get to the ground. Um, okay, so before I start, uh, could you do me a favor? And I hopefully also do yourself a favor. Uh, I'd like you to put in the chat something that is giving you joy right now. Now, this could be something really big. Um, maybe, you know, your sister had a baby yesterday. Good for you. That's great. Um, but that doesn't happen for all of us. And if there's nothing that pops to mind, just look around the room in front of you for even the tiniest joy. The tiniest thing that when you look at it, it just feels happy. And absolutely anything. And let's just watch what pours into the chat because a sharing of joy is always a delightful thing. And I love, my favorite thing about this is the range between things. Popeyes, I love it. <laughs> we range from the kids going back to school, which is I'm sure happy and for so many complicated reasons. Hot tea, painting, abstract art, Beautiful. Um, I think it's a delightful thing to begin in um, a place of joy. Um, and Lindsay launched us so beautifully at the start um, by grounding us. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, so this presentation will discuss what I learned adapting the blended model of Drama 100 Introduction to Theater for Remote Delivery and how it changed not only what the course will look like upon return to campus, but my thinking about the whole endeavor of teaching students within the institutional structures of a university. I'm going to start by discussing what I did in Drama 100 to ground the discussion in a real-world example. Then I'm going to offer a bit of a provocation for us to consider. This provocation is not yet a conclusion. It's something that I'm still very much working through. It's an idea to pursue in the next phase of my development as a teacher. I thought it might be worthwhile sharing it with you all here to see what you think about it. But more on that later. To begin, 
a discussion of teaching Drama 100 in the middle of a global pandemic. So some background on Drama 100. This is an introductory course about theater. It includes both skills-based and content-based learning. Topics include the nature of theatricality, the impacts of performativity on stage and in real life, affect, mimesis and representation, intercultural performance, and the ways in which theater reflects, interrogates, and or subverts assumptions about the human condition. I've been teaching the course for over a decade, originally in partnership with other colleagues, first Dr. Jen Stevenson and later Dr. Kelsey Jacobson. Um, interestingly enough, Dr. Kelsey Jacobson was student Kelsey Jacobson in the course when Dr. Jen Stevenson and I taught it. So that was a beautiful experience, that arc. Most recently though, I've been teaching it all on my lonesome. Drama 100 uh, has been part of a variety of teaching and learning initiatives over the years, including a large scale research project into blended learning. Indeed, it's thanks to that project that the course has been using a flipped classroom model, blending both online and in-class learning since well before the pandemic. We shifted to a blended model back in 2016. Materials that were traditionally delivered in lecture or as assigned readings are now woven together into online modules. These modules consist of screenings, readings, and 50 minutes approximately of lecture videos discussing theoretical concepts. The enrollment for the course traditionally ranges between 175 and 220 students. Each week, students complete the online module, then have one 90-minute class with me dedicated to group discussions and exercises, and then they attend a lab dedicated to creating theatre. The labs are led by fourth year undergraduate teaching assistants with a typical student to TA ratio of 14 to one. Now the labs are not used as venues for reviewing lecture materials. Instead, they run parallel to the lectures with separate learning outcomes. The labs are devoted to theater creation. Learning outcomes are geared towards developing students problem solving skills and collaboration, um, inviting them to explore abstraction in artistic creation, and most importantly, reinforcing the importance of an iterative creation cycle. This is essentially an application of the scientific model to the creative process, or at least that's how we describe it to them. We ask them to identify a creative problem, formulate a plan for making something, execute the plan by making it and then reflect on how it affected both audiences and artists. Then revise the plan or the problem itself or both before embarking on iteration 2.0 and later 3.0 of the project. The labs also though, and this is important, have a non-academic learning outcome. We value the ways that the labs can welcome students into the Dan School of Drama and Music community and into the broader theater making community at Queens. Um, to quote a famous 1980s sitcom, the labs should be a place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. That is our core philosophy. Okay, so when we originally redesigned Drama 100, our guiding principle was that anything that would have originally been delivered as one-way communication, which is me talking at rather than with the students, would be moved online. In-person time would be dedicated to two-way communication and creation via live discussions and exercises. After all, what else is theater but an art form that thrives on having live immediate two-way interactions between artist and audience and dies when it becomes purely a one-way endeavor? It was a no-brainer then to embrace a teaching model that more fulsomely reflected this spirit. When the pandemic hit, I knew that I wanted to retain this two-way interaction. Even though there was pressure to move to a fully asynchronous format because of time zones, equity concerns, logistic difficulties, my instincts were that having meaningful synchronous interactions would be essential to surviving the upcoming year. If not for the students, then definitely for me. Teaching the course asynchronously ran against all of my instincts as a theater scholar and artist. Now I'll tell you a little secret. Some of us may have gotten into theater for the attention, um, but the real reason we stick with it is the connection it provides with an audience. The pandemic stole that connection from us in the theater. 
which is why you saw so many theater artists find ways to reach out to their audiences via Zoom and other platforms in ways that tried to retain interactivity and synchronicity, even though we couldn't be live together in person. So I held on to the weekly 90 minute synchronous session with the students, as well as a weekly synchronous lab session between the students and their teaching assistants. Now, thankfully, because of the blended learning project, the majority of what we would traditionally call lecture content was deliverable via asynchronous modules. So this allowed us to be a little more freewheeling with how we use the synchronous time. In spite of everything I've said about the blended learning models ready adaptability to remote learning, however, I still had to make several tweaks to the course design to adjust to the conditions of pandemic learning. Now, much to my surprise, these tweaks yielded unexpected benefits, including an uptick in the quality of student work, which I really did not expect. Of the 175 students in the course last year, 160 submitted all of their work. I was really pleased by that, um, given that it's a first year course in the pandemic. Was it all on time? No, but we embraced the spirit of universal design by building extensions into the assignments themselves. For example, each week students must complete three responses in the course. If they hand them all in, they get three points. It's just a completion grade. But if they hand them all in on time, they get the full four points. We have weekly deadlines for the responses, but late submissions are accepted all the way until the end of the semester. Also, there are bonus assignments that can be submitted to regain any points lost due to late submissions. This allows students to miss a module here and there, but make up for it later. It's a manageable system and it adapted really well to this year's conditions. And I think it helped us reach a completion rate roughly equivalent to the pre-pandemic iterations of the course. Um, I can also report that the quality of assignments was surprisingly high. I'm using the same rubrics as last year, and the overall average is one step high on the letter grade scale. Um, I feel like learning outcomes were better met by this iteration of the course than past versions. And there seemed to be a genuine enthusiasm for engaging with the material. Um, for example, students were expected to write 200 word responses, and the majority exceeded their minimum word limits by 50% or more, sometimes doubling the word count. Now, why did this happen? Uh, I suspect it is partly related to the revisions I made to the lecture videos. Knowing that learning conditions were less than ideal this year, I revised the videos to be more targeted, concise, and easier to follow. It may also have something to do with the fact that everyone was trapped at home with nothing else to do. Um, but maybe another contributing factor was the synchronous sessions themselves. Maybe Zoom and the challenging conditions of learning forced me to listen to the students in a way that I had not done before, to hear them by observing their behavior and by feeling their alienation. Zoom put me in the same affective relationship with the course as the students were experiencing. No longer was it me at the podium and them in the auditorium. All of a sudden, we were all trapped in these same damn boxes. It forced me to make a choice, the choice that the pandemic has demanded of all of us, which is to give up, hunker down to preserve my own safety and retreat to my silo, or find ways to reach out across the void and find more humane models for doing what we do. So my attempts to make Drama 100 more humane yielded insights that have transformed the course and I think are reinvigorating my teaching going forward. Yes, like I suspect most of us uh, are feeling, I'm entering this year physically and mentally exhausted, um, but I got to admit, I'm also feeling a tinge of excitement. I'm starting to suspect that because of the pandemic, maybe in this dense brain of mine, I've acquired a bit of new wisdom that's managed to weasel its way in there that is starting to revive my teaching. So my insights, are twofold. What I learned about creating concise, accessible, navigable, and engaging online content, and even more crucially, what I learned about the value of instructor-led synchronous sessions, whether remote or not, in supporting student wellness and engagement. These synchronous sessions, in initially intended to supplement the online modules, 
evolved into vital opportunities for building community and connection. As the semester progressed, I discovered small but effective strategies for fostering community and wellness that I will most certainly retain as we move back to campus. My thinking over the past year was inspired by one idea. How can I make the alienated experience of remote learning in a pandemic more humane? I was inspired by a couple of theories related to the study of affect, something that has been a common topic of interest in theater studies, where we investigate the multifaceted relationship between a spectator and a theatrical event. Scholar Eleanor Fuchs describes the experience of watching a play as making a visit to a small planet. So here's what she says. As spectators, we encounter simulated worlds with each play we watch. In the first few minutes of a production, we're bombarded with sensory stimuli and we're asked to orient ourselves within the unfamiliar circumstance of this new fictional play world. But isn't this what we do in everyday life? The only difference is that we're not self-consciously aware of ourselves as spectators adapting to new environments. Cognitively, however, we are essentially spectators, embodied spectators to our everyday existence. We encounter the world as filtered through our senses. What we perceive, what we select for attention, consciously and unconsciously, and what we cognitively process into comprehension comprises our moment by moment experience of existence. It's not a big leap, or in the spirit of the ICE model of assessment, a big extension, to apply what we learn studying a spectator's response to a theatrical event and use it to think about how students respond to life as remote learners. For me, I use affect theory as a theoretical lens guided by two scholars, Aaron Hurley and Sarah Ahmed. An affect-oriented approach asks us to consider how spectators respond intellectually, but also emotionally and physiologically to stimuli. Theater scholar Aaron Hurley provides a useful triumvirate of terms for considering how theater productions affect us based on this three-part um, structure, affect, emotion, and mood. Affect is a blanket term for the physiological responses we have to stimuli. It is how our body responds. Are we thrilled by a trapeze artist? Are we disoriented or nauseated by frightening images or disturbing sounds and music? Do we laugh in response to stimuli or does our heart rate increase, our toes tap, the hairs on the backs of our necks stand on end? These are affective responses and they remind us to consider how the body interfaces with a perceived experience. Emotion is how the mind processes affective responses into something conceivable as emotion. Um, and this is Hurley sort of borrowing from William James here, but with some modifications. And of course, I'm massively oversimplifying um, at this point. So say a bear appears in the woods in front of you, the body's gonna respond affectively with appropriate fight or flight responses, including increased heart rate and adrenaline, heightened alertness, muscle tensing. The mind is gonna take all of these and understand them to be what we call fear. Um, but for our context today, I think the most useful is this third, which is mood. Mood um, is not as concrete as an emotion. It's a more diffuse form of feeling, almost like an atmosphere. Um, I can be in a melancholic mood or a generally happy mood, or I can enter a room where the mood or atmosphere is tense or joyful. The thing about mood is that it greatly influences how the mind interprets physiological responses into emotion. It provides almost a sort of context. Um, it can even influence how the body might affectively react to stimuli within that context. Mood can prime the mind and body to have particular reactions. Now, scholar Sarah Ahmed looks at the circulation of happiness among a community. Ahmed proposes a way of thinking about how happiness circulates involving what she calls happy objects. These can be actual objects like a teddy bear or conceptual objects like an idea, a theory, or the thought of attending a particular course. Drum 100 can be a conceptual object and so can 
Graham Rennick, the instructor. A happy object can spread happiness if the individual perceives it as happy. Puppies, for instance, are highly effective, happy objects because they are highly affective. They can change a person's mood and the atmosphere of a room very quickly. I asked you to list some joyful things um, and those, all of them are for you, happy objects. Objects can also be unhappy objects. Remote learning is an example of an unhappy object for many people. The thing is, not only can these objects affect the mood of the observer or the atmosphere of a room, they can also affect each other. Graham Lorenick, the, Graham Rennick, the instructor, if first encountered in a negative atmosphere fostered by the unhappy object of remote learning, can also become an unhappy object. One object can infuse another with its affect. So, inspired by this research, I tried being mindful of the student's affective experience of my course. I acknowledged that remote learning on cue and Zoom were all potentially unhappy objects that I had to contend with. So how could I deal with these and how could I change the students' affective and emotional experiences of this remote nightmare? By playing with mood. Mood was something I could manipulate. I can't change a pandemic, but I can alter the mood of what my course is. I could maybe start to establish Drama 100 as a happy object. At the very least, I could counter the effects of the unhappy objects that caused most students to enter the door in a bad mood. They might enter in a bad mood, but hopefully the room they enter into is joyful. It kind of worked. Indeed, there was a snowball effect as the year progressed. The students who attended the synchronous sessions regularly started to identify this course as one of their favorites and as something they looked forward to each week. I had a loyal regular following of 110 students who attended religiously, which surprised me in these conditions. Drum 100 did seem to become a happy object for those who attended the synchronous session and or the synchronous tutorials. And they began to bring that into the space to the point where I looked forward to the class each week. Cameras remained largely off, but the chat was vibrant and active and often joyful. Several students reported at the end of the year that they really liked the atmosphere of the course and more tellingly that they were grateful for the feeling of connectivity it provided. So some concrete strategies. What did I do to try and make it be more humane? What strategies eventually worked? Um, well, I've kind of grouped them into three groupings here. Um, and I'm gonna briefly touch on each of them. So the first one, from remote learning to blended learning or the benefits of flipping the classroom. So when flipping a classroom, what was really valuable um, in the training that we received and the mentorship that we received from the Blended Learning Research Project and from folks at CTL was the imperative to think about anything impersonal that occurred in the class and put that into an online or asynchronous um, context. And then anything that's more personal and interactive to make it live and synchronous. Um, so we actually got rid of online discussion forums that we were using previously, moved the lectures online and returned the discussions back into the classroom, into a synchronous moment. Um, so then the other thing was then what I said earlier, which was whatever we use in the room as one way talking now moves online into tightly scripted and edited video. Um, with clear sound, good lighting, and often my face talking to students in front of the images. Um, we also have um, generated captions and edited transcripts for the students and the ability for them to watch me on double speed. Um, all of these are technological advancements that were massively improved over the last 18 months, thank goodness, um, as well as the institution's investment in them. So here's what we did. I did go to film school in the last 18 months via Google, um, but I am not originally trained in these things. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is I just 
did my best. And if I ran into a problem, I Googled it. And usually someone could explain to me on an online tutorial how to make it work. Um, but I would script a video, um, usually between three and eight minutes, never longer than 10. Uh, and I would focus the video on a particular concept, um, which would allow me to move the videos around in the course and reuse them. Um, so I didn't combine concepts within a video. Um, if I had a concept and then an application of the concept to an example, I put that in two separate videos because then I could have the video that explains what theatricality is. But if I felt I needed to record a new contextual example, I could do that later without having to replace the first video. So all videos were made towards an idea of having a five year lifespan of usability in the course. Um, I filmed the videos in front of a green screen uh, and then I swapped out the green screen with a PowerPoint presentation. And that's what you see in the image below. That is just a PowerPoint slide. Um, and I would put slide timings on each of the PowerPoint slides. Uh, and then I would export that as a movie using PowerPoint. And then I would just layer it behind me on the, um, the green screen video. Uh, and I always left myself a little bit of space for um, where I could talk. So this PowerPoint that you're watching right now is essentially what I would have created to make one of these videos. I think the benefit of this is that the students have my face for most of the presentation rather than just my voice over a PowerPoint. Um, the human face is a miracle. Our abilities to express things through even the subtlest of facial and eye movements is boundless. This is another thing that we study as theater artists. Um, one thing you learn when you work in the work that I do is that you can fill a stage with dazzling scenery and special effects, but as soon as you move one single visible human onto that stage, the audience focus will immediately move to them. It's just how we're built as human creatures. So, these revised videos, the synchronous Zoom sessions, both worked together to try and remind the students of the power of human presence, even if it's only a face projected over the internet. And then the other thing I learned was to finally discipline myself to script the videos. Um, as we all learned, the cognitive load of paying attention to online lectures during a pandemic is immense, especially amidst the other distractions of remote learning. For those unfamiliar with the research, the cognitive load of learning can be assessed as a combination of three factors, the intrinsic load, the extraneous load, and the germane load. The intrinsic load is the cognitive load or the thought burden of the lesson itself. The extraneous load is the cognitive load required for processing the delivery of that lesson. It's basically the cognitive load of the teaching. And the germane load is the load required for actually learning the lesson. So as teachers, we can't manipulate the cognitive load of the lesson itself. Intrinsic load is intrinsic load. Einstein's theory of relativity has its own innate intrinsic load. What we can manipulate is the load imposed on students by our teaching. We can look at what's germane to learning and what's extraneous to it, ideally reducing the latter through better course design, organization, and communication. Scripting the videos was an important part of reducing extraneous load, not only because it streamlined the lesson, but it also removed all the ums and the errs, the unfinished sentence fragments, and in my case, the frequent random musings and digressions. Okay, so two, the value of true synchronicity. Oops, got ahead of myself. Itchy trigger finger. Uh, the pandemic revealed the true value of the synchronous session to me. If anything, this is the single most valuable lesson I learned over the past year. Co-presence, a meaningful, thoughtful, and genuine co-presence between learners and teachers is invaluable. My work during the pandemic helped me realize this and also realize that I wasn't using my synchronous sessions effectively pre-pandemic. I was present with the students live and in person in those sessions, but those sessions had become secondary lectures rather than genuine sites of interaction. 
I wasn't listening to students as well as I could have been in those sessions. Zoom allowed me to hear and see the students in a different way, even when they had their cameras off. The chat in particular was invaluable for this. It's important that students feel seen and listened to by someone in the institution. This year it made it so clear that this is vital um, when dealing with the alienation of remote learning, but it's something that I'm gonna to continue to emphasize moving forward. Tutorials are especially valuable for this because they offer the chance for a 14 to one ratio. Um, those of you who are graduate students, you have the potential to be one of the most significant figures interacting, especially with junior level undergraduate students at the university. Um, it is hard to see a student in a 1200 person lecture, but it is much easier to achieve this in a 30 to one context. Um, simply by learning people's names and demonstrating that you are delighted by their presence with you in the room. The value of that uh, is immense. Um, and that is something that um, we have started to integrate more explicitly in the training of our TAs within Drama 100, our strategies for that, fostering that kind of a learning environment. So what I realized was that carving out time just to be together in a meaningful way was invaluable in these sessions. Being together became a priority in remote learning, but I'm gonna hold on to it going forward because remote learning is alienating, but so is first year university full stop. The priority relates to fostering a learning community through transforming the course and the course space into a happy object. As this happens, the investment in meeting learning outcomes hopefully increases. We know this from the research in engagement. Um, meeting learning outcomes includes supporting human wellness. So in Drama 100, we supported this through what I started to call wellness interventions. Okay, so here are some examples. Um, to me, what drives the notion of a wellness intervention is that it's all about atmosphere and mood. How can I use mood to transform the course into a happy object and the course space into a happy object? One, I can play fun, upbeat music as people enter the call. Um, I would play the Mamma Mia soundtrack. I'd play Ella Fitzgerald. What I realized is it actually took me forever to choose the right song. Picking the right song with the right tone, the right feel, it had to be sort of affectively and lyrically the right way to enter the room. Um, two, we would play a costume game or a special object game where I would just say, turn off your cameras and I'll give you two minutes in the room that you're in to find a silly outfit from whatever is close by. And at the end, we all turn the cameras on at once. Crucially, we framed the exercise as a gift for others, a way to cheer up other people in the room so that it was framed not as a task that the student had to do themselves for approval, but as a service-based task for others. Um, and this seemed to uh, result in greater adoption of willingness to do this. Um, it took a few times, even in a drama course, the first time I had maybe five people who put on costumes, eventually it increased. We would also ask them to find a happy object in the room and just show it on the camera. And we got everything from sandwiches to baby sisters, um, which was fantastic and itself hilarious. And then we would do a different kind of check-in. Um, I'd been recommended by several sources to do the before and after check-in, you know, sort of a survey saying, how do you feel right now? How do you feel later? Um, and I found on some days these worked, but as we moved into the darker days of winter, um, I don't know if the rest of you who tried these found something similar, but I found they started to become counterproductive because of how they affected the mood of the room. Um, if everyone in the chat is declaring that they are feeling stressed and sad, the mood of the room changes. So instead, we tried different kinds of check-ins. Um, and the goal was always to elicit simple joy in the check-in. 
So the one I started with today was one example. Um, what's a thing in your room that gives you simple joy? Um, I would ask what tiny thing that happened in the past week, um, a squirrel in your backyard running around, or you got lucky and got a really tasty apple from the grocery store in February. Um, I'd ask people what their favorite word is, sometimes in terms of meaning, but then I'd also ask them just your favorite word in terms of how it sounds, because it's silly. Um, I'd ask them to recommend a stupid or completely absurd television show, something that you watch that you know is stupid, but you love it anyway or favorite desserts or scariest movie you've ever seen? Um, or what's your favorite thing to listen to when you're seeking comfort and joy? Or the happiest song that you can think of? So let me try that one with you now. I want you to just put in the chat right now uh, the, the happiest song that you can think of in the moment. First thing that comes to your mind, just a happy song. And let's just see if we get any Staying Alive, Walking on Sunshine. These are also good. I'm going to copy these because I'm going to need a bunch of songs to start lectures with this week or next week. There is such beauty in the range of what we're getting. But also now I'm thinking of all of these songs. And it just gives me joy. They make me smile. Um, Interestingly, what I discovered from this was not simply that they were a nice way to start the class, but these are what jump-started the chat as a place of conversation and joy. It sort of opened that, it was an icebreaker would be the best way to put it. Um, okay, so those are the check-in examples, pardon me. The other thing too, is we had explicit discussions of wellness. Um, but again, mindful of mood and their effects on mood and the potential of the class to be a happy object. Um, so at week nine, I had them give themselves all a round of applause just simply for having made it into the Zoom call in week nine. Um, we discussed how that in and of itself was a triumph, even if they hadn't handed anything in in the course. They should still give themselves a pat on the back for showing up in adverse conditions. Um, we discussed how acknowledging that can be hard and that being human can be hard. And then we used that as a venue for pointing out resources for help. Shortly after that, I received a bunch of emails from students who hadn't handed things in asking for help getting back on track in the course. Um, and prior to that, I don't often get people reaching out because they're afraid of me. I'm the instructor in a course of 180 students. It's deeply impersonal. Um, so it's, it's a job spending the year breaking that down, that barrier. Um, it was to give people the excuse to seek assistance because most people don't want to. And to point out explicitly that asking for help is not failure, it's actually success. It's being proactive in seeking solutions. Um, and we also discuss transparency in terms of grading and thinking of that as a wellness strategy, that using rubrics and sample assignments to set clear expectations is a way to foster wellness amongst the students. It's not purely about accountability because it provides an existential wellness. Um, uncertainty, as we have also learned in the last 18 months, um, is existentially deeply alarming. Um, so those are some of the wellness strategies that I've used. Um, and after this, I'm just have one more phase to the talk here. But after that, I'm going to ask some people um, to share some of their own wellness strategies that maybe they've used in their teaching or they've encountered students um, or they also used with each other just socially to just hold on over the last 18 months. Um, some of you have children, so maybe you've seen some of the work done by your kids' teachers, the heroic work done by your kids' teachers, and what they have been able to foster. Um, so I'll give you some time to think about that while I move on to the epilogue and my provocation. So if I had a summation of what we've learned from remote learning or what I've learned from remote learning, it's that we undervalued 
or underestimated the value of presence, but also that it is possible to create a sense of presence online. Um, it's possible that a sense of being present together does not occur by default just because we're in a real life classroom. And strategic interventions can support the creation of presence and community. This realization that we underestimated the value of presence and more importantly of a meaningful co-presence between instructors and students as part of a genuine community of learners has triggered the provocation in me. This is what I was talking about way at the start of the talk. Um, it's a provocation I'm making to myself as I explore my teaching moving forward, but I'd like to share it with you here this morning. Um, for lack of a better description, let's call it a shift in premise. So the learning conditions of the pandemic were obviously isolating, disorienting, impersonal, and frankly, often right out inhumane, no question. But experiencing them firsthand led me to wonder, were these conditions exclusively related to pandemic learning? Or did the extreme situation of the pandemic merely magnify issues already endemic to the post-secondary education experience? So I wanna take a swing at something here and see what you think. As my provocation to myself, I'm adopting a new premise as a thought experiment. The premise is this, Post-secondary education is currently formulated at this and similar institutions is inherently inhumane. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that it is bad or that it is somehow the wrong approach. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that regardless of the overall benefit of the post-secondary experience, and I think it's considerable, there is some inherent inhumanity baked into the model. Universities operate on what Sir Ken Robinson called an industrialized model of education. It's basically an assembly line where learning starts and stops based on the clock, not based on actual skill acquisition. We start teaching in week one, and then the class stops at the end of the semester so that everyone can move on to the next phase. Regardless of whether the student has met the learning outcomes or not, the conveyor belt keeps moving. Students are assessed to see if they get to move to the next level, not necessarily assessed to see if the skill has been acquired, although they may appear at first glance to be the same thing. If the student passes, they continue along the assembly line to the next course in their journey. If they don't pass, they fall off the belt, or perhaps even worse, they squeak by carried relentlessly forward by the conveyor belt, but left careening unstably at risk of falling off into the gears at any moment. Imagine the cost of being, the cost being exerted on the psyche by such constant instability and insecurity. Now I paint a bit of a bleak picture, but there are benefits to this model and it's important to acknowledge them. This model has allowed us to scale up education to serve large swaths of the population. We could certainly create a more bespoke educational experience, but it would require spending a lot more money on much fewer students. We could be an elite private Ivy League university offering a world-class education to a kind, tiny cohort of elite students. But while that model certainly benefits its students, does it benefit the greater public in the final analysis? I mean, how we define elite certainly matters in that context. Is it academically elite or socioeconomically elite? The bespoke elite model may advance learning and research that ultimately benefits the world, but it also locks down the halls of political and economic power. As a brief and alarming illustrative example, five of the justices of the US Supreme Court are Harvard graduates. The other four, all graduates of Yale. That seems a little troublesome to say the least. Um, so even though what we're offering may be an inherently alienating assembly line model of education, at this point, I'm not sure whether there's a better model available. If we're gonna continue offering a post-secondary education at scale to large swaths of the population, um, regardless of whether there is a model available and maybe some of you have one in mind, 
I doubt that we're going to be able to get it up and running before I have to teach Drama 100 next Tuesday morning. So, barring any major systemic changes happening over the next seven days, I have to accept that the system we've got is the system we've got. In my own teaching, that's what I've decided to do with open arms as a thought experiment, as this provocation. I'm going to embrace that A, I am working in a system, a machine, a conveyor belt. B, I'm going to assume it's inherently alienating. But C, I'm also going to assume it's not perfect, but maybe it's the best we've got right now. So we return to my provocation, a provocation I'm setting for myself moving forward. I will acknowledge that what I am doing here as a university instructor is inherently inhumane. I may be doing it for the benefit of the humanity and with the best of intentions. I may even be helping to make it a more joyful and productive journey for everyone and successfully. But the fact remains that in its day-to-day -day operations, the university experience as currently modeled is inherently inhumane. It is inhumane because arguably by necessity, Many human elements of learning have been replaced by systemic elements. Acknowledging its inherent inhumanness is perhaps the most humane thing I can do as an instructor. Here's an interesting caution to add. I'd wager that many, if not most of us here on this call, managed to get through layers of academia successfully, probably even several layers of graduate school. This tells us that we are likely very well adapted to this system. Therein lies the potential for a huge blind spot among us. It's easy to forget how inhumane a system can be for others when we are able to navigate it successfully and comfortably. So acknowledging that the industrial model is inherently inhumane and acknowledging that I can't renovate the system anytime soon and acknowledging my own privilege within the existing system, what can I do? Well, I can seek out interventions to make the whole experience just a little more humane. I described some of these in my presentation about Drama 100, but with a caveat, they might work for you, they might not. We teach different courses and we're different people. Teaching strategies are not wholly transferable from context to context. So as I near the conclusion here, rather than leave you with yet another teaching trick or strategy, I'm gonna conclude with what I think lies at the core of everything I'm discussing here, the spirit of what I'm talking about. Everything I'm talking about in terms of finding interventions to make the experience a little more humane, it all starts from a default place of love. I love my students. Now, we all say that. I've said that to myself for years. But what I realized was I've never interrogated that statement. What does it really mean to love one's students? The past year has really forced me to think about that question. And indeed, attempting to answer it is where my provocation risks evolving into a manifesto. Now, my apologies if that's the case. Um, what can I say? I teach theater. Where I come from, uh, manifestos are kind of a thing. So what does love for students look like and what does a love for learning look like within an inherently inhumane system? First and foremost, it looks like respect. My default with students should be to respect them regardless of whether they respect me. This is not a two-way street. I am not worthy of their automatic respect. Acknowledging the inherent inhumanity of the system reminds me that I have immense privilege in the student instructor exchange. The system works for me and it continues to benefit me financially and professionally. And I'm saying this as an adjunct instructor currently struggling to complete a PhD dissertation while also teaching full time. If I was a tenured prof, the system has worked for me even more. And the privilege I would possess in that case is astronomical compared to an individual undergraduate student. To be quite frank, given these imbalances, we do not deserve students' respect. If anything, they deserve ours for being here. Second, with love and respect, comes a sense of service. If I truly love my stu students, then I am here in service to them um, and I am well compensated for it. That's my starting place as a teacher. 
how do I be of service as an instructor? First and foremost, by reminding myself that I'm asking them to do things because I think it will benefit them, or at least I should be asking them to do things because I think it will benefit them. And that I've thought long, hard, and very carefully about what this really means. The educational developers and designers at CTL are invaluable resources for helping to process this point. They will help journey through what are the tasks that you are asking a student to complete and how these align with the learning outcomes and whether the learning outcomes are indeed appropriate for the context of the learning environment. Have I curated a body of knowledge for the course because I think that's what the students need most? Have I designed assessments to, sign them, to set them up for success in learning, not to trip them up? And am I assessing the learning rather than the student? Assessing the learning is assessing our exchange as teacher and student. If it's not working, then I need to diagnose where the problem lies in the exchange rather than simply dismissing it as the shortcomings of a student and moving on. To me, teaching is merely a hypothesis of what we think is going to work in the exchange between student and instructor. And assignments are the data set used to assess the hypothesis. If the data reveals a failure, then the next step is to diagnose the source of the failure. If the entire data set is showing a trend towards failure, the problem is probably me or something in the delivery. If the data set is largely moving towards success with periodic outliers, I still need to figure out why my outliers may be outliers. Are they outliers because the student stumbled? Or is there a trend in outliers that could identify something else in the structure that I could correct? Finally, with love and respect and a sense of service and a healthy reminder of my own privilege within the system should come humility, a surrendering of the ego and a continual openness to the possibility that I can be wrong. Academic life in theory is all about embracing what we don't know and living comfortably in that uncertainty as we pursue knowledge and learning. In practice, however, it is a world that can breed deep insecurity and the fear of admitting one's ignorance and or mistakes. This is a place, an institution, where not only students but faculty are evaluated on a near constant basis. We have grades and peer reviews and merit assessments and reputations staked on knowing, on expertise, on having, expressing, and defending opinions with a certain degree of certainty that certainly should be, seem certain to others. The conveyor belt moves relentlessly forward for all of us, and that can breed a shaky ego. But when it comes to our students, we need to try and set that aside if we truly love them. We need to be open to self-assessment, to the idea that teaching is a series of hypotheses under constant revision and to the idea that sometimes we get it wrong. Again, the CTL is a beautiful place for embarking upon this self-assessment. We also need to distance our personal issues and feelings about the students from our professional responsibilities. We are their tour guides through the Byzantine institution, on some days I'm prone to calling it a madhouse, known as higher education. To me, this is maybe the hardest part of loving students because I have relative privilege and security in this system. And because of that, loving them means keeping a professional distance. It means not taking it personally when a class load of students tank me on a course evaluation. It means not getting upset when they question my choices or challenge my decisions or accuse me of being out of date or fire off an angry email after really receiving a low grade. It means trying whenever possible acknowledging that some situations require different interventions because of safety, to turn every opportunity into a teaching moment, an opportunity for self-reflection and learning, not only for them, but also for me. And it remem means remembering this system, because it is a system, will often forget to honor individual dignity and humanity of not only students, but also staff and faculty, especially those in more precarious positions. The system we've got is the system we've got. It does not have a human element without us making an effort to provide it. So I guess that's what lies at the core of my provocation. 
Um, if I accept what I do for a living is inherently inhumane, then how can I infuse a little of the human element back into it? What can I do to reach out to students and colleagues? And how can I create a learning environment that fosters meaningful co-presence and celebrates the partnership between learning instru and instructors? How can I truly love my students in this context? And how can I create out of this inhuman system the sense of a happy object of learning? So I started this year trying to figure out how to move Drama 100 online because of a pandemic. It was all logistics and mechanics and scheduling and zooming and on queuing and feedbacks, fruiting, feedback, fruitsing, feed, fruitsing, feedbacking. Then I started playing silly music and putting on funny costumes to lift some spirits. But now as I turn towards home from this long odyssey, this is where I've ended up. It's all about love. That little tiny bit of wisdom, hopefully, is what I've acquired from this massive disruption. I admit that when I say it out loud, it can sound a bit pat, pithy, and simplistic, but like all the best lessons, it's the kind of thing that the mind thinks it has learned in the telling, but that the heart truly learns through experience. We've gone through something significant over the past 18 months, and as we've heard repeatedly, the return to normal won't be, or hopefully won't be, a return to the old normal. It will be a return to a new normal. Yes, we've got a ways to travel yet, but the ship is starting to head towards port. The new normal is on the horizon, and I guess it's time we start figuring it out. So thanks for your time, and thanks for taking this weird little journey with me this morning. This is where I'm going to stop. But I look forward to hearing some of your strategies for making your classrooms more humane and joyful learning environments. And I'm also really interested in hearing what emerging wisdoms you think you may have acquired during this period of major upheaval and hopefully transformation. So as a final gesture, I'm going to leave you with this throwback to the beginning of the pandemic, when even the smallest of technological tasks seemed insurmountable. Insurmountable is just a silly little reminder of just how far we've come. Thank you.